Hello, I'm James Holland, and in this series, we're investigating armoured fighting vehicles of the Second World War. And in this episode, I'm looking at the mighty Jagdpanther. In July 1944, the Wehrmacht unleashed a new weapon in its heavy metal arsenal, a self-propelled anti-tank gun. So this is a Jagdpanther, or a Schwerpanzerjäger, as the Germans called it. Despite first appearances, this isn't a tank at all. The reason it's not a tank is because you can see it's got no turret on it. It's a tank hunter. The reason the Jagdpanther makes it onto our list is because events often force the Germans to deploy it to do the job of a tank, but that was far from the original plan. The whole idea was that they had this anti-tank gun and they wanted to be able to make it more mobile, more manoeuvrable, and so they were thinking about how they could do this from as early as 1942. But it wasn't until July 1944 that this was finally entering service. And that's the finished result. Three meters wide, nine meters long, three meters tall, and it weighs 45 tons. It's a big machine. It was built on a Panther tank chassis with the gun mounting on top of it, quite high profile so that it's got lots of room inside for the crew and for the gun, of course. The legendary Pac-43 88mm. That gun could hurl a shell at 3,400 feet per second and it's one of the best anti-tank guns of the entire Second World War. In its short service history, it actually caused a lot of havoc for the Allies that it was coming up against. The Red Army in the East, and the Americans and British and Allied forces in Northwest Europe. So, a very well armored, very well balanced, heavily armed, mobile anti-tank gun. That's the Jagdpanther. Only 415 of these incredible machines were ever built, and fewer than 10 remain. Just three are still in operation, including this one. Joining me to pour over this mighty tank destroyer is Mike Gibb, founder and director of the Wield Foundation. He's the mastermind behind the decades-long journey to restore this machine to its former glory. Mike, this is just magnificent. I mean, what a thing to have. And how did you get it? And what was the restoration like? It was a nightmare. <laughs> to be truth be told, I don't think I'd ever ever do anything like this again. Oh really? It took us 10 years to restore. All the internal fittings had actually gone. We're talking now early 2000s now. Okay, so 20 years ago. Yes, so prices then were a lot different, but the cost was still absolutely staggering. Well, I can imagine. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of 45 tons worth of Second World War hardware, isn't it? The key thing about any of these restorations is, is identifying what the chassis number is. Right. Or in German, what they call the Fahrgestellnummer. Okay. And that will tell you exactly who assembled it. It's always on the left-hand side, drivers, at the driver's shoulder height. Okay. So where you get into any one of these things, it's the same with the Stug, it's the same with uh, um, most of these armoured vehicles, you will actually find a chassis number on the left-hand side where the driver's shoulder is. So. We could see where it was, but we couldn't actually make out all the bits and pieces because remember, this had been a range target for years. Right, okay. This was originally brought back by a gentleman called Colonel Gilman, right. who was responsible for uh, the uh, testing grounds in Northern Europe. This was brought back for evaluation here. Now the chassis numbers, if I can just show you the chassis number here yeah. very quickly, because we're talking about that. Um, 
That's this. This is this. This is there. Right. This is what actually um, what tells you everything. This is basically the 86th example that MNH had actually been that put together. Right. Now the chassis number itself is 303086. Now knowing that, because we found that's what we found on the inside, we could then determine what these missing external uh, finishing detail was. So right. we could then go, for example, to Aberdeen Proving Ground, because Aberdeen Proving Ground has an MNH, but it was captured in right. December uh, 1944. It was involved in the uh, Ardennes Offensive. Oh, the Battle of the Bulge, yeah. Yes. And so we could use that as our start point, if you want to call it. And luckily with those guys, they'd actually welded shut all the rear hatches, the top hatches and everything. So it was essentially a time capsule internally. How wonderful. I mean, it's it's absolutely magnificent. I mean, it looks, you know, pretty much as good as it was when it rolled off the factory floor. We took it back to that because we don't actually have a specific individual vehicle history for this. We do know where it went. OK, we do know what vehicle, uh, what uh, divisional unit it was it was handed to. Right. But that was which the one? only which was the uh, 116th Panzer Division, right. the Windhoek yes. Division. Now, again, this information which came from Colonel Gilman was wonderful because what we did is we put the picture together and the engagement that actually cost this one its life, uh, its uh, operational life, so to speak, was the against the Guards Armoured Division. Ah. Now, that's what we know to this point. There's obviously all sorts of threads still going on in terms of photography and everything else, and there's some wonderful photographs we found of uh, of captured Yag Panther in British Army hands mm -hmm. in 1945. Amazing in the theatre. So that's uh, that still continues. So as well as a huge amount of elbow grease to get one of these into back, back and restored, it's also a lot of detective work, isn't it? I mean, well, the detective work's the fun. Yeah. See, I prefer that a lot more than the actual restoration because without the research, without actually, let's say. I would say five to ten years worth of research on this particular one and that research is still continuing sure uh, you wouldn't actually be putting something together that's correct no absolutely First thing I'm drawn to is, is is these stuck on the side. You know, they, they seem pretty thin. They are very thin, between five and six millimeters, depending on the corrosion, but they are absolutely essential for taking the initial impact of a round that's fired against the tank yep. and uh, allowing the interior to be as safe as possible. And then the, the tracks, I mean, the, the bottom half of it is so clearly the same as the Panther, isn't it? It's got the same interlocking wheels, the same tracks, same sort of chassis yes it is essentially from the chassis up when you try and draw the chassis even then they had made differences so you're not talking about a straight panzer uh, panther g swap right for a yak panther and building a superstructure on top of that even there they had to find differences of course this very very efficient interlocking suspe um, suspension uh, very, very nice, comfortable ride. But is, it, is that over-engineered? Is that just too complicated for, no, for it's purposes? Fan fantastically over-engineered. Over uh, it's one of the problems that the Germans have throughout the whole war. They're just, they're just over-complicating something that, you know, a, t a tank uh, or a tank destroyer like this is a very complicated beast. And what you want to do is make something that's complicated as simple as you possibly can. And yet it seems at every level they're kind of just making it just more complicated. Just make it more difficult for themselves. More yes. difficult. And then you've got this, this sloping armor, haven't you? And you can see this. I mean, gosh, it's really thick. You can yes, just see it's, it's just 80 millimeters thick at 80 the front. millimeters. How close did we need to get to these things in order to be able to take them out? Right. You're talking about 100, 150 meters. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. I mean, you know, anything greater than that, the, the shell just bounces off, doesn't it? It bounces off, but it also doesn't penetrate. There's some wonderful pictures of these that have actually taken rounds right. with big chunks out of the armor, but they haven't actually been penetrated. So here you've got the gun, the big Pack 43, 88 millimeter. I mean, it is a, it's, it's a big gun, isn't it, this one? And the, and the gun mantlet around it, again, this just looks seriously solid. You've got your, you know, 80 millimeter of armor, then this as well. Yep, so this is 
phenomenal when you actually think of how huge and heavy this thing was, yet it was only designed as a defensive weapon. It right. wasn't an offensive weapon. No. And you would have these things way behind where the, uh, let's say, the action was going on. Right. And these would be hidden. Well, okay. that's the theory, isn't it? I mean, that's the theory. Yes, in reality, obviously, given the fact that these things only came out from what mid 1944. Yeah, onwards. July 44 is when they were yep. first. When mid 1944 onwards, uh, you're talking about a situation where these things, in many in many circumstances, were actually fighting individually or in small groups, and that was not allowed. That was totally forbidden. Yeah, yeah. Insofar as their instructions were concerned, but that's what they had to do. I'm also noting there's no hatch for the driver. This is a driver position here. Yep. He's just got a periscope. That's all he can see. All he can see is through that. And it's a tiny, tiny little periscope. And he's got a tiller on uh, a handle on either side, which gives him some uh, degree of, of uh, left and right vision. Then you've got an MG34 here. Yes. You need that because you need to, in case you need to clear any infantry or anything like that, or soft, you know, that's softer correct. targets. That's And again, that's uh, a sustained fire barrel. Right. And that is uh, what they call a Schwererlauf. And that's right. for, because you can't exactly get out and change your barrel. Your jack block here. Yep. Um, because as you can imagine, if you try to put a jack immediately onto the, onto the ground here, to lift up your track in order to remove any of these wheels sure. without something like that, it just wouldn't purchase. And then you've got, you've got the, the towing cable yes. and, um, and, and back to the rear. And this looks, again, this looks very similar to the pamphlet to me. And then you've got your, uh, you've got, this is your late pattern. Earlier right. on, they were making real problems for themselves. They had cost. Uh, exhaust mantlets. So these were cast and they're all rounded and everything else. And yep. these have been welded instead. Yes. And then here you have what's called a Flammenvernichter exhaust. <laughs> now, why would you have something like that? Because what used to happen was these, they would have a heat signature, not only a heat signature, but a flame signature, which was visible at nighttime. Right. And visible, obviously, when it was, uh, let's say, dusky, because you'd see this flame firing sure. out. If you take this off, your flame will go out about 10 feet right. on either side. So these, what they did was, they've got a series of, um, it's like a venturi, um, almost like a, a series of discs, but with um, uh, little wings in them. So when the flame goes into them, they it essentially get eaten up by the exhaust. And so very little comes out apart from your smoke. Right. But Mike, the big question is, is how do you get into it? The only way to get onto this is to actually stand on the wheel or stand in the um, on the sprocket on the sprocket but the easiest one is to stand is to stand on the um, put your foot on the on here and then you pull yourself up right it clearly requires a certain amount of agility <laughs> got it so this is this is obviously the engine bay this is your access point? Yes. And if you think things are heavy, just open the engine bay hatch. One, two, three. Oh, God, it is really, really heavy, Mike. I'm... That's phenomenal. It will rest. Okay, so hold it up. No, it will. It should rest. Yes, it'll rest. Okay. Okay, wow. Well, look at that. I mean, that is a, a, a quite amazing, amazing piece of kit, isn't it? I mean, that, that looks much more sophisticated than you would imagine for a Second World War era engine. This is a Maybach. It's a v, uh, V12, um, it's a Maybach HL230, right. and it is a 23 litre V12 engine. Goodness. And these were, these were also, given the time and the war and everything else, and also in subsequent years, these were at the cutting edge of uh, of engine design in those days but not easy to get in and out i mean terribly difficult so where you're standing all of that needs to be taken off yeah. okay we had a problem with the magnetos not too long ago and you ha actually have to take the deck off in order to get at the magneto so this was not actually designed with maintenance servicing in mind i cannot get over how heavy this <laughs> this is no, <laughs> Jesus, this is this is one for to kind of you know jolt your vertebrae, isn't it? 
Okay, you got it? Yeah. Mind your foot. Right. Whoa, there we go. So now, can we get inside? Yes. Let's pull this open now. This is again. And this is a decent bit of armour plate as well, isn't it? Yep. Okay, mind your fingers. Yep. Well, I've got to say, Mike, I mean, obviously, any kind of um, armoured fighting vehicle is pretty cramped, but um, compared to a tank, this is, this this is, is luxurious. Like, it's like a flat. Yes, it is. It's very nice. So what are the positions in here? You've got five crew. So where are they? Obviously, drivers just over there. Driver right down in the front. Yep. OK. You've got your gunner here just behind him. The commander's position is on this side. Goodness so me. then in front now of where yep. the commander is, you have your um, machine gun, machine gunner slash radio operator. So okay, so the so the loader is just loading. That's all he's doing. Okay, so where's the so loader? the loader? Well, um, the loader is essentially over here where I am. So he's got to, and remember, for a uh, a lefty, it's tremendously difficult if you right. left-handed because you take them out, you take the shells out like this. Yes, and then you will load them in here. Um, Getting them out of there, okay. Would he just come over to this side? You'd have to do that. You'd just have to come over and just go like so that, that's, wouldn't you? That's, you would have to do that. That feels it's very unnatural. It would, it's very unnatural this way as well. So some odd ergonomics here. There are. But when these rounds are full and yep. live, these are very heavy. Very heavy. They're heavy enough as they are deactivated, but... Uh, with a non-deactivated uh, non round, yeah. it's much, much heavier. One man job though. A one-man job, that is correct. So then he taps the chap in front of him when, he's, when it's uh, loaded. Um, he would tap the gunner on the head, and the gunner then is responsible for the sighting and everything else. But he does actually get helped by the commander. Right. And what's this here? That there is a foul, um, it's called Abluft extractor, so a foul air extractor. So, so that just gets all the, the noxious fumes. the cordite and all the noxious yep. fumes. And there is something near your feet there as well, which is even more sophisticated. Um, which is basically a, an inertia pump. Huh. And so when you stop, the pump comes into action and that extracts the, expels the bad air or the abluft from the barrel. So that, that shoots it out to the end of the barrel. And then this is, this is for discarding the... That's where, you, where your uh, shell casings, you, uh, you throw it out of there. How about that? And you just shove it out? You just throw it out. Got you. And but I mean, I mean, the recall on, on the Pack 43, this a big 88 millimeter. I mean, how far is that coming back? Obviously. Well, that's going to come right back to here. So if you if your gunner is doesn't move his arm away quickly enough, his arm will be crushed. Remember, it's all about timing. This guy here is responsible for the firing. If the loader himself hasn't actually told the gunner that he's ready, OK, or the gunner fires, OK, when he feels he should be firing and this guy's still loading or has just loaded and hasn't got his arm out, he's lost his arm. God, I wonder how much that happened. And that happened a lot. That was not something which happened infrequently. It did actually happen a lot. So there's documents that were produced in the war which show you what you're supposed to be doing with these Jagdpampers and sort of do's and don'ts that were issued to all the crews. But this is a defensive weapon, you know, do not go off on yes. your own. The, you operate in company strength, all this kind of stuff. Only, but if you were in company strength, you had to report only to division command. This was not supposed to be used individually. You were not supposed to use them in groups of, uh, in a, a troop size, which is six. They had all those, but uh, again, in the urgency of uh, of war, especially in late 1944, or for, sorry, from July 1944 onwards into 45, they didn't have that. Um, you know, they didn't have the latitude no, to, be able to do that. I mean, I, I you know, I, I can recall a, um, a an instance where just six of these Yag pamphlets were kind of rushed forward to provide some firepower, fire support for some infantry that were caught in a town of Giel in Belgium. Four went round the top of the town, two just stayed where they were, to the southeast of the town, waning behind a hedge. 
a troop of Shermans came across and they just took them straight out just like that. But I mean, you know, that was operating as two. And then there was one Yag Panther that actually turned off, what, either it got lost or was doing a kind of bid for glory, I don't know. But, but it went into the main market square where it was pummeled and knocked out by a Sherman Firefly. But, you know, that was operating individually, which, of course, is completely verboten. Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly why that um, the individual Yak Panther you're talking about was taken out in that square, because they would be absolutely hopeless in a situation like that, because yeah. they've got no, as you can see, peripheral vision here. All you, you're limited to these periscopes, you know, around you here, and that's it. And if you want to stick your head out and you are on your own in, some, in, a, in a market square, yeah. uh, you really are taking... Well, you're taking your life in your own hands. You know, when these were designed, when they were conceived, when they were being produced and going into action, they were designed to be, you know, an, a, a tank destroyer. I mean, you know, long range yes, tank but destroyer. Yes, a defensive, a defensive, defensive tank, tank destroyer. destroyer. Absolutely, Correct. not an offensive. But the point is, by the time they actually do come into the front line in July 1944, it's it's a question of just getting whatever mobile firepower you've got up to the front and and. You know, every, everybody's doing everything, whether you're a tank, whether you're a Stug, whether you're a Yag Panther, you know, sometimes, sometimes you're having to do all those roles together because the situation of the war is such that that's all you've got. It's chaotic yep. and you yep. have to make do with what you what you can find. So although a Yag Panther is absolutely strictly a, 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 a tank destroyer, um, a defensive tank destroyer, it is being used like a panzer quite a lot of the time because... There's no alternative. Yes, no, that's correct. Well, Mike, you know, kind of being here in the, you know, sitting out at the top of it as it's trundling forward, you do get this sense of immense power, don't you? But, crikey, I wouldn't want to be in one of these. That's one thing, and you wouldn't want to be in it with an 18-year-old driving the damn thing, would you? No. If, should something go wrong. Yeah, but yeah. being in this, I suppose, in those days, we were saying earlier on, you had to get around the side of it to knock it out. Yeah. So as long as you were in a position like we are right now, here you are, you're positioned looking out yeah you've uh, got the protection of the hedge you're under the tree you know it's pretty well naturally camouflaged and that's before you've even put anything over it correct and if you're in a position like this given the fact that this is a defensive weapon yep you're not in bad shape i suppose the other thing is is that you know american armored fighting vehicles are all designed on the same principle principle as an automobile so if you could drive a car in america you could drive a tank or a truck or, or anything else it's all pretty straightforward it's stick shift it's kind of you know brake clutch it's all incredibly straightforward and simple but this is a completely different kettle of fish isn't it i mean it's much more complex yes the big uh, the real re really really bad complication here is the uh, is this um, a dual uh, braking system which is actually all hydraulically fed or <laughs> hydraulically operated Goodness. so as we were saying earlier on if something goes slightly wrong there or your settings are slightly out you can't turn. And if you can't turn, you can't steer. Right. And your, and your transmission is complicated, isn't it? That's very complicated. Yes, that's complicated enough in itself. It's, uh, I mean, how many gears does this thing have? A total of eight. Six forward gears. Yeah. One crawler gear. Yeah. Extra slow gear. Yeah. And one reverse gear. And of course, the problem you've got by 1944 is you're using ever older or ever younger recruits. And of course, most people in Germany don't know how to drive beforehand. I yep. mean, you know, so you're getting, you're cutting back on the training, you're getting younger people, and you're putting them in something which is ever more complicated. Yes, and uh, for the older people, it mightn't be as challenging. But for an 18-year-old to be issued with something like this would be terribly difficult. But it's interesting, if you, talk, if you look at kind of wartime reports and, and reports on the performance of, of the Ag Panther, I mean, what you're getting is, you know, 50% of them are, are, are conking out before they even got into combat because, you know, final drives are going or, you know, something goes wrong with the transmission or something overheats or, or whatever it might be, you know, a whole host of different things because it's such a complex piece of, of, of equipment. 
We, we've and had you haven't that, got the kit to restore it in the field either. No, we, gonna... We've had this discussion again and again and again. And I can't tell you how many uh, hundred kilometres we've actually done in this with all those multiple shows, events here as well as elsewhere that we've actually undertaken. And nothing like that's ever, ever, ever happened with us. And that's because the people that are driving the machine and the bloke who actually got out the machine put that much more focus and attention or places that much more focus and attention into the actual driving. He can right. feel his way into things. Yes. He understands it. But if you put somebody who's 18 in this and he tries to drive it like a Ford Escort, it's going to have problems yep. because it's simply not built for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you haven't got the right personnel to deliver this, deliver the battlefield advantages this could bring. Correct. You've got to actually feel your way through it. It's a tremendously complicated steering system, braking system, and of course the engine, all the complications from the engine. And the amount, so the amount of breakdowns that you have, had rather, I am sure would have been negated if you'd had a really, really well-trained, highly trained specialist crews. But having said that, it was what it was. It was uh, the war demanded ever more younger people and older people to operate things like this. Well, Mike, huge thanks to you and to Martin who drove us and to the Wheel Foundation for letting us come here today. I mean, it's, it's whatever the plus and minuses of this, it's an extraordinary um, living, breathing, example from the Second World War and from the Third Reich's arsenal of armoured fighting vehicles and uh, a really, really fine example. Thank you. No, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. One thing that's absolutely not in doubt is that the Yag Panther is a really fearsome beast. It's got that massive Pack 43, 88 millimeter gun that can fire at kind of over a kilometer a second. It's got huge armor, it's got power, it's got incredible strength, and it's certainly got a huge amount of fear factor as well. You know, it was designed as a mobile anti-tank gun, a Schwer Panzerjäger, heavy tank hunter, and you can see it's ticking all those boxes very, very nicely. You know, it's, it's, there's not many things in the Allied arsenal that can actually penetrate that kind of armor, certainly not at the front. And there's not many guns in the Second World War that can match the Pac-43 for velocity and sheer weight of force. On the other hand, you know, it's, it's a very complex piece of equipment and it's coming into operations in July 1944 when, frankly, the Wehrmacht and the Waffen-SS are starting to disintegrate. And, you know, if you're throwing 18-year-olds, 17-year-olds, 19-year-olds who are incredibly inexperienced into something as complex as that, it's going to go wrong. It's a defensive weapon and the Allies are going forward and the Germans are basically going backwards. So once one of those things conks out, you've got no means of recovering it. So it's got all sorts of shortcomings as well. And, you know, when it was conceived, the idea that was that these would operate in big numbers and they would operate as mobile anti-tank guns a little way back from the front. Um, but, but the nature of the war by the time they come in, in the summer of 1944, is, you know, it's firefighting, it's plugging the holes in the damn wall. It's just too little, too late, too complex, too over-mechanized, too over-engineered for the role that it's been set. Nonetheless, that is a really, really impressive piece of kit with its incredible Pac-43 high-velocity gun, with its frontal armour, with its size and with its sense of power. And I'd certainly want that in my arsenal. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel. HistoryHit.tv. You're going to love it.